all the world a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Those lines set the tone for what I'm about to speak to you about and why I decided to dress in uh, an appropriate attire for the era. What I'm doing now is also stage work. It's also educational. It's also medicine. And I think we will have a lot of fun. And I will tell you that when I was preparing for this, I, I work all the time. I'm, I'm an absolute workaholic. And, um, but reading Shakespeare has always been pleasure for me. And so now I could claim I was working while doing something tremendously pleasurable. So I want to set the tone by telling you that it isn't just about the plague that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about a lot of different aspects of medicine that we find in the, in the plays that were written by Shakespeare, including, of course, his emphasis on psychiatric problems of various natures. Starting with uh, King Lear, this cold night will turn us all to fools and madmen. In fact, if you go through his plays, you'll find, depending on your level of detail, somewhere between 712 to 14,000 medical references in the plays of Shakespeare. And you can see <clears throat> that he had uh, all kinds of topics, psychiatric topics, internal medicine, infectious diseases, to say the least, were particularly relevant to him. <laughs> Here's the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh, oh, oh! Lady Macbeth washed her hands repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. What did she have? What condition? obsessive compulsive behavior leading her to madness and eventually to death by suicide. And of course, uh, the soliloquy that uh, most of us, or certainly I had to memorize in high school, to be or not to be, that is the question, whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. This is the quintessential dilemma of a troubled mind, a very troubled mind that we have in Hamlet. But his knowledge extends beyond the mind. For example, we have here Henry uh, IV, part two, where he uh, describes, uh, War Warwick describes the appearance of Gloucester's body. And as you read through this description, you'll notice at the end that he says, it can't be but that he was murdered here. At least all of these signs were probable. And this is a very, very excellent example of forensic pathology knowledge, well illustrated by Shakespeare. What else did he know? Beyond death itself, he recognized that other things can mimic death. So we see in uh, Pericles, the Prince of Tyre, Act 3, Scene 2, where he describes that death may usurp on nature's many hours, and yet the fire of life kindles again the overpressed spirit I heard on Egyptian that had nine hours lean dead, who was by good appliance recovered. And by then, that doctor, Sermon, who found the wife of uh, Pericles, Thalesia, who had been uh, gone overboard, as you know, uh, was in fact in a coma. So he understood clearly that there are altered states that happen that are not death, and they mimic death. And if we look through uh, all of his plays, we find that he is particularly interested in how emotions can lead to ills, and in particular, to death. And here's a list of many of his plays and who dies and why they died. And in all of those instances, you can see that it was grief primarily that led to death. In fact, there are 10 deaths from strong emotion in his plays, all of these from grief, uh, typically at a loss of a loved one. But what's interesting, too, is that in some cases, he alludes to excessive joy as possibly being a source of, of, uh, of death. And um, some of the deaths are sudden, some are not. In addition, 
He also notes a transient loss of consciousness or fainting reported in at least 18 different cases. So let's look at this and ask, you know, is this something that really happens? Is this something that's medically sound? Because as one example, uh, the death of Lady Montague, as described by Montague himself, he says, alas, my liege, my wife is dead tonight. Grief of my son's exile hath stopped her breath. What further woe conspires against mine age? So is this really possible? And of course, it is. Extreme emotion can lead to death, particularly if you already have a dodgy heart, right? Cardiomyopathy or ischemic heart disease. But in fact, there are uh, the uh, Lancet published that 30 to 40 percent of sudden deaths in young people uh, young adults has been linked to ion channelopathies, which is a way of affecting the electrical function of the heart. And they can have a long QT in, uh, syndrome, which is one of these types of uh, channelopathies that can lead to uh, sudden death. So he was right again. Not only that, he also notes that loss of vital bodily function can reflect judgment, mind, and emotion. And a perfect example of this is in King Lear, where we see in Act 3, Scene uh, 7, at, uh, set in Glocher's castle, how uh, his evil sons, not his good sons, uh, with help from others, are actually pluck out his eyes. And this is probably one of the most frightening scenes in all of Shakespeare's plays, where they, he, they pluck out one eye, and then a servant tries to intervene to keep the other uh, eye from being plucked, and the servant is killed, and then his other eye is plucked. But this is, of course, also a metaphor, a metaphor for the fact that he was blind as to which of his children actually loved him, just as King Lear himself was blind to which of his daughters actually loved him. He also linked physical illness with mental illness. And, um, one of these examples would be in Richard III. Who here remembers the play Richard III? <laughs> well, Richard III uh, is, uh, is uh, of the York uh, group, uh, and uh, you know, if you remember the War of the Roses. And uh, that skeleton that you see there was identified only a few years ago. It was, it was actually unearthed. And uh, by DNA studies, they were able to prove that that skeleton uh, did belong to someone of the York line. And they do have some evidence linking that particular skeleton to uh, Richard III, who is always depicted in, Shakespe in Shakespeare's plays as having a hump back and being deformed. And if you look at the very, very, very first soliloquy that Richard speaks in <laughs> now, that's so famous, now is the winter of our discontent, as it starts out. And as it goes on, he says, but I am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court. And he is, speaks about his affliction, and then later, towards the end of that soliloquy, he says, well, and because of all that, basically, I'm determined to prove a villain, which he does, because he winds up um, murdering a whole host of people in the play, not the least of which is his two beautiful nephews in the tower. So this is a, a, a clear example of um, William Shakespeare recognizing the impact that our health has on our mental condition. And now I'm going to show you that uh, something I think you will find a bit far-fetched, but I think you will enjoy. And this is from The Tempest, scene two. And this is Trinculu, uh, who is kind of a fool, but kind of a very interesting guy. And he speaks out and says, what have we here? A man or a fish, dead or alive? A fish, he smells like a fish. A very ancient and fish-like smell, a kind not of the newest. Poor John, a strange fish. Now, why would I bring that up? I bring that up because, believe it or not, there is actually a rare metabolic disease, okay, <clears throat> that's called uh, trimethylaminuria. It's a medical condition where people smell like fish. 
Now, maybe Shakespeare met someone who smelled like fish. Not sure. But it does actually happen. And now I move on to what you were wanting to hear about, and that's the plague. And we start with Romeo and Juliet. A plague on both your houses, says the dying Mercurio, who, by the way, also makes the incredibly astute comment, hounds, a dog, a rat, a mouse, a cat, to scratch a man to death. Was he alluding to these uh, other creatures being good vectors and good transmitters of, uh, of Yersinia pestis, perhaps? Some realization of some of the basic epidemiology, which wasn't actually known at the time? Perhaps. And actually, Romeo and Juliet is a perfect one to talk about plague in, not only because it is mentioned, but um, Plague is mentioned in many, many, many of Shakespeare's plays, but it's central to Romeo and Juliet. You see, oops, sorry. If you look at it, <clears throat> remember <clears throat> that Romeo and Juliet, in the end, kill each other, each one thinking the other is dead. But that had been a plan. The plan had been to mimic the death, not to actually cause the death. And Friar John uh, never delivered the letter informing Romeo that it was a ruse. And the reason that Friar John was unable to deliver that letter had to do specifically with the problem of the plague. Because they basically quarantined him. They were afraid, they was, they were afraid he was contagious because he had been tending to the sick. And by not getting the message to Romeo in time, we end up with the tragedy of the death of both Romeo and Juliet. And you can see that in Friar uh, Lawrence's uh, speech there. So look, he says, I will be brief, for my short date of breath is not so long as is a tedious tale. Romeo, they're dead, was husband to that Juliet, and she, they're dead, that Romeo's faithful wife. I married them, and their son married Day Willis Doomsday, whose ultimate death banished the new-made bridegroom from the city, for whom, and not for Tibat, Juliet pined. Then gave I her, so tutored by my art, a sleeping potion which so took effect as I intended, for I wrought on her the form of death. Meantime, I writ to Romeo that he should come hither, come as this dire night, to help to take her from her borrowed grave, being the, the time the potion's force should cease. But he which bore my letter, Friar John, was stayed by accident, and yesternight returned my letter back. What a shame. But it also, by the way, does speak to the fact that they knew about poisons and things that could mimic death. So an extra bit of medicine thrown in there. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the plague uh, and how it relates to all of this. Um, there have been three great pandemics of the plague. The, the one in the Justinian plague in the, in the uh, around 542. AD, and then the one in the 14th century known as the Black Death, and the one that's still ongoing that started in China in the 1860s. And the first two killed um, <clears throat> uh, somewhere, be particularly in the one in the, in the um, 14th century, killed 30 to 60 percent of the population of Europe, Central and South Asia, and North, America, uh, North Africa. Uh, the ringing around the rosies is, of course, from that uh, song that children sang, ring around the rosies, pockets full of posies, achoo, achoo, we all fall down from the plague. So what about this Black Death? It's in the, we're talking the 1300s, we're talking the 14th century, that's long before Shakespeare. How is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because after that big Black Death of the 14th century, it kept coming back in an unpredictable manner for the next 300 years, and it kept causing major epidemics in different cities and in different towns. And the Great Plague of London would, would be the last big epidemic 
and that was a little bit after uh, Shakespeare's time, but there were several during his lifetime. In fact, if we just quickly look through the plague epidemics, so we have the, the 14th century epidemics, uh, which are listed here a, a number of different times. It kept coming back, 1348, when it all got started, all the way to the beginning of the 1400s. And if you go to the 15th century, once again, you keep seeing it rear its ugly head over and over and over. And these are actual literal uh, references to what was going on in those particular dates and those particular times. And last but not least, um, in the uh, 16th uh, and, early, and 17th century, which if you'll notice, overlaps very nicely with the time that Shakespeare lived on this earth, there were quite a few major uh, plague outbreaks in England. And they affected him. Uh, there was a plague outbreak on the year that he was born, and there were plague outbreaks throughout his career that would force him to leave London and go back to Stratford-upon-Avon and interrupt his work. And that's because Shakespeare's England was a dirty, dirty place. Uh, microbes flourished absolutely everywhere. Their homes were very poorly ventilated. They were overcrowded. They, and, uh, and this, of course, makes it very nice for uh, airborne microbes. The, as far as sanitation, it was absolutely non-existent. Personal hygiene was abysmal. If, uh, if Queen Elizabeth bathed once a month, that was a big deal. Um, I understand King James, her successor, who, was the, who followed uh, Queen Elizabeth and, and uh, Shakespeare did perform for him as well, never bathed once in his entire life. They say he simply dipped his fingers in water, and that's about it. And that's the monarchs. Uh, people lived with their livestock, which is a great way to facilitate zoonotic disease and, uh, and help, you know, uh, spread these things. Of course, the use of dirty knives, they had no concept of non-dirty knives and swords and arrowheads is a wonderful way of uh, bringing microbes into human bodies. Um, there were uh, syphilis throughout the prostitute places. Uh, sexual behavior uh, never ever included the use of any protection. Forget about condoms. So this was an era that was very close to the earth, let's say. And you have to understand it precedes germ theory and it predates any epidemiology. So all these microbes that are so real in the lives we live just were non-existent as far as they knew. And now I'm going to make a stretch. Hamlet says <clears throat> in Act 2, Scene 2, there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Do you think, perhaps, that he was uh, anticipating the fact that we now know that some of these microbes do us good and not just ill? The whole concept of the human microbe, uh, microbiome? Perhaps, perhaps not. What else do we have here? This is Henry Percy. He was a real life guy who's depicted in uh, Henry IV, uh, both in part one and part two, part three. Uh, uh, par uh, Henry Percy, the first Earl of Northumberland, his son uh, was very, and him, they were very upset that Henry IV didn't keep his word. And, uh, you know, after they had helped him obtain the throne. So one of the um, consequences of that is that his son, who was Hotspur, decided to have a battle against Henry and lost. And an interesting thing that uh, Northumberland says is, for when he learns of his son's death, is this, for this I shall have time enough to mourn. In poison there is physic, and this news, having been well, that would have made me sick, being sick, have in some measure made me well. Now, what does that have to do with medicine? Immunology. 
That's basic immunology. That's why we use vaccines. That's even why if a little, you take a little bit of a poison at the right time in the right place, your body develops the immunity necessary to protect it. So there we go. He's actually um, knowledgeable about immunology as well, or so I would dare for you to disagree. Camilo, who is the loyal retainer to, um, <clears throat> to, the, to the king, uh, speaking to the King Polixenes of Bohemia, who his king wanted killed, and uh, Camilo was too nice a guy to actually kill King Polix uh, Polixenes, says, there's a sickness which puts some of us in distemper, but I cannot name the disease, and it is caught of you that yet are well. It is caught of you that yet are well. Now what's he talking about? Asymptomatic carriers, exactly. He understood the basic principle that someone who does not necessarily manifest illness can certainly spread a disease. For example, influenza is a disease that um, when a little child gets infected, they start shedding virus two, three, four days before they look the least bit ill. And let's take a look at Again, King Richard III, um, that evil villain that uh, killed so many people, when he was speaking to William Hastings, who was serving as Lord Chamberlain to Edward IV, his brother who he helped kill, by the way, and, and also lied about and, and helped bring him to his death. So um, Hastings informs Richard that Edward is on his deathbed, and this is what Richard III says. He says, oh, now, by St. Paul, this news is bad indeed. He doesn't mean it, of course. Oh, he hath kept an evil diet long and overmuch consumed his royal person. Tis very grievous to be thought upon. What? Is he in his bed? Evil diet. Well, see that? He understood the importance of nutrition towards health and infectious diseases. So I've pointed out a number of different instances where there's a, a unique awareness of medicine in the works of Shakespeare. How on earth did Shakespeare know so much about medicine? Well, a number of people believe that he may have learned it from his son-in-law. His oldest daughter married uh, John Hall, who was a physician. He was also a Puritan, and, um, and that's an interesting thought. Uh, he was supposedly quite a good doctor, but the truth is Shakespeare had already written many of his plays, including the dramas that have medical references, before John Hall ever uh, completed his studies and left Cambridge in, in 1597. And um, by the way, there's a very interesting other play, which is not a, um, a play by Shakespeare, but it was written for the Shakespeare uh, group and it's called The Herbal Bed, and it alludes to uh, John Hall and uh, Susanna. One of the things that really distressed Shakespeare in his life, he had a number of very bad things happen to him. Uh, his son, uh, ha Hammett, died when, uh, when the boy was somewhere between 11 and 12 years old. Uh, we think that he may have, in fact, died of the plague, which also is a, another fa contributing factor to uh, Shakespeare's awareness of that disease. But the herbal bed alludes to the fact that his daughter was uh, accused of being an adulteress, and therefore um, that, uh, it, as far as we know, it was not true. But uh, that's another very interesting play you might want to see, which is not a Shakespeare play, but it's similar. And so we say he probably learned it on his own. Why would he know so much? Well, let's remember again what Shakespeare's England was like. Uh, remember, they, they lived in these little single-level, dark, cramped, airless, thatched hovels. They lacked waste disposal. You can just imagine how yummy it must have smelled to walk down the streets of London with open sewers and people throwing slops out the window that might happen to land on your head, um, slops being poo-poo and <clears throat> other interesting things, right? So these were dank places. Um, virtually everyone was infested with fleas and other blood, 
uh, sucking arthropods. And of course, there were plenty of mice and rats and perhaps even a few gerbils. Um, there was a Scientific American article that linked uh, some of the spread of the plague to gerbils as well as to rats. And as I alluded to earlier, the plague actually interrupted Shakespeare's theater a number of times. In, in fact, the plague of 1592 that lasted until 1593, uh, the plays were, ha were performed by his own company at the theater and the church in Shoreditch, north of the Thames. The London public playhouses were repeatedly closed because of outbreaks of the bubonic plague, and there were probably a total of about 60 months of closure between May 1603 and February 1610. And in 1609, it was a particularly bad outbreak of the bubonic plague, and he went back to Stratford-upon-Avon. So um, plague raging meant nobody wanted to get into crowds and nobody wanted to come see plays. And we know that as he was walking those streets, uh, those bodies would be accumulating, rats and fleas would be multiplying, and he would be witnessing the flopping arms of wagons with corpses on them. If anybody here has ever seen Monty Python, uh, <laughs> bring out your dead. Huh? And the father says, I'm not dead yet. Don't worry, Dad, you will be soon. And put him onto the cart. Um, so physicians were pretty much powerless. They wore those uh, funny costumes that you saw in the flyer. Uh, some people felt that the fumes had, were a way in which this thing was propagating, so they put uh, flowers in those uh, bills to try and protect themselves, and, uh, but it didn't work. And in fact, William uh, Gilbert, who was a physician to Queen Elizabeth and also to James, died himself of the bubonic plague. He was also an astronomer, by the way, quite an interesting fellow. And a plague continued to rage in, in England uh, long after the time that Shakespeare left this earth. And as I alluded to earlier, the greatest plague uh, in, in England was the Great Plague of London, which was in 1665. And here's a quote from Samuel Pepys uh, about that plague. In the city died this week 7,496, and of them 6,102 died of the plague. But it is feared that the true number of dead this week is near 10,000 partly from the poor who cannot be taken notice of, to the greatness of the number, and partly from the Quakers and others that will not have any bells rung for them. So this is a disease that has had a tremendous impact in history. Um, as I've traveled different European cities, such as uh, in Vienna, uh, I found a monument to the plague. Uh, which you see depicted there with bodies raised all the way to heaven with an angel on the top. And in Spain, um, in Toledo, a marker to the plague as well. And of course, in England, in the works of Shakespeare. It's, a, uh, it's something that was not well understood in his time. They thought it was a venom or a poison or something generated by the body. They didn't truly know where it came from. It wasn't until uh, the end of the 19th century that um, Alexander uh, Yersin and Kitasho Shebasuru, more or less at the same time, independently described the tiny, and I tell you they are tiny because I have looked at them under the microscope, the Yersinia pestis. They are very, very small, and they're classically called as, as looking as if they have um, a safety pin appearance, and that's actually very tough to see because they are so very, very tiny little um, nasty things. It's amazing how tiny little things can have such great impacts on our bodies, on our communities, and on history in general. And if we look through all the things that Shakespeare did, all his plays, uh, and I'm trying to bring this to a, a, a faster end, instead of telling you all the different plays in which he describes all these different things, I alluded to some of them the impotence, the insanity. He, he mentions leprosy. I, I omitted that because he mentions it as, oh, I don't have leprosy, so you better look at me, uh, from Margaret. Um, but he talks about a whole host of medical entities in his different plays, and uh, it's clear that he was quite the aficionado 
of medicine, as he has often been called an aficionado of the law of his time. And um, with that, I leave you to uh, oops, understand uh, basically that he uses afflictions to drive the plots and motivate his characters. He has true insight in, medical, in these medical afflictions. He has uh, a clear way of revealing the link between physical and mental health. And he even provides a glimpse today of uh, health and medicine in Elizabethan and Jacobian England. Any questions? I saw a hand. Yes. Yes. Um, what about the theory that the, that the costumes used by the physicians to be like they actually help to spread the disease even further? Well, um, I, I don't. I don't know if I if I if I buy that. I I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, what would certainly be true is if they were wearing the same outfit time after time, vis vi visiting uh, the same you know, the same patients without changing, and most likely they were, then it would probably be reasonable that they would be infested with fleas and that those fleas could go from place to place. But the reality is, is just not known. Yes? Can you talk to elaborate a little more about mm -hmm. how it's still in Asia? Like, how is it still contained there in China? I think you said the third wave. Oh, yes. Well, we, yes. Um, the, the big difference between the current pandemic of plague and the, and the plague in the 14th century that went on and on to have multiple epidemics is that we have treatment. So in the United States, in the Four Corners area in particular, we have rodents that, have, that harbor Yersinia pestis. And every year in the United States, we get seven to 10 cases of human beings with the plague acquired here in the United States. It's just we know how to handle it so it doesn't become a major epidemic. Would you compare uh, the plague with Ebola? Well, yeah, there's a lot of uh, interesting things. First of all, number one is, of course, bubonic plague has a 30 to 40 percent uh, mor morbidity and mortality uh, untreated. But any given individual the bacterium can get in, can spread from the lymph nodes that are affected, these huge buboes that people had with the plague, get into their bloodstream, and from there, seed the lungs. And that individual can then develop pneumonic plague. And when a person has pneumonic plague, uh, a, a few very serious things happen. Number one, his chances of death are now 100%. Uh, untreated, and in a very short period of time. We're talking about 24 hours. Number two, the cells that are infected by Yersinia pestis, the, the macrophages in the lungs, alter the physiology of the bacteria in such a way that it is um, more dangerous. So when that person with pneumonic plague coughs on you, then uh, your chance of getting plague is quite high. Uh, this, by the way, happens in the United States. We get pneumonic plague, is plague when cats get infected with plague because they tend to go into pneumonic form and then they'll sneeze and cough and then someone can get that. So of the pneumonic plagues that have happened in the United States, about 20 of them in the last 30 years, um, they've been through m mainly through cats who got infected. So well, how is that similar or different? Well, first I want to talk about the morbidity because uh, Ebola, depending on which, which particular species of Ebola and then which strain within the species, untreated also has a ridiculously high level of morbidity. And that's, in, that's looking at it from a very scientific perspective. But also, let's look at it from the fear that's generated and how people behave. And that's another very relevant thing because we saw during the Ebola outbreak, whatever country started seeing cases within their nation, uh, not somebody brought in to be taken care of, but simply you know, manifesting in their country like we did here, we got panic. We saw panic in Spain. We saw panic in the United States because people recognize that this can be extremely dangerous. So there are a lot of different kinds of parallels that could be drawn. Yes? Yes? 
Uh, since you mentioned the four corners, I have to relate my own experiences. I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico from 1982 to 1989 and oh. discovered soon Hot after up. I got there that the plague was a rather common thing to take note of because people go hiking up in the nearby Sandia Mountains and there were opportunities there of coming across dead animals, infected animals in terms of fox, coyotes, and and even, you know, people took their dogs with them. So there would sometimes be on the evening news you'd see warnings about some, you know, animal control found a dead animal that had the right mix for people to leave their pets behind. One weekend, someone had a, after a hike went to one of the hospital emergency rooms, well, diagnosed with the plague. Then they realized that person had been sitting there for several hours and they were putting out widespread calls if you were in that particular emergency room between those hours, you needed to go back to the hospital. Um, and then just to wrap it up again, how we, it was one of those interesting things, and again, my God, there really is still the plague, but then people were also very blessé about it because a popular t-shirt got created that you could buy in Old Town, the tourist area of the city that said, New Mexico, land of the flea, home of the plague. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, that's great. Yeah, I, I, it's funny because when you also mentioned the years that you were there, uh, early 90s, that's also when that Four Corners area had a different kind of very serious outbreak, uh, what's now called the Sinombre virus, which, which killed a lot of uh, individuals in the Four Corners area. Um, and, and, and these things, they happen. Uh, you know, we had the Ebola outbreak. Now everybody's worried about Zika. There'll be something else next year because life finds a way and these and our, our, our global movements, the climate change, all the different things that are constantly happening uh, allow for different organisms to take the lead and, and frighten us. Could you talk a little bit about the global impact of tuberculosis, which probably existed in Shakespeare's time even? <laughs> Well, absolutely. That's been one of the, the huge killers of mankind, time out of mind. You're absolutely right. Um, funnily enough, there's not a lot specific about TB in, in Shakespeare's writings, and there ought to be, but there really isn't. Um, he does talk about chorizas, uh, so colds and stuff, but not so much about um, that. That became a, 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 perhaps a, a bigger issue for humans when we started living in more and more crowded spaces. And because this is a, the type of pathogen that needs a little bit of closer contact um, and, and can't be spread you know, via a vector like the flea that can you know, travel uh, on, on the back of a rodent. So um, tuberculosis, uh, right now the biggest problem in the world with tuberculosis is the fact that there is drug resistance to tuberculosis. Uh, sometimes it's multi-drug resistance and sometimes it's extra drug resistant. And uh, as a matter of fact, just today we were discussing um, on a call to, to Washington how the, the different communities uh, throughout Europe, Latin America, and Africa are confronting the antimicrobial resistant issue with TB because uh, if we lose the ability to fight this uh, pathogen, it, it, it would be absolutely devastating. And one of the reasons that uh, people cannot fly on some airplanes is if they happen to have extra drug resistant TB. They'll put, they're put on actual no-fly lists. So. Um, there's so much I could tell you about tuberculosis. I really don't know where to start, start and where to stop. You, you, you ask me a specific question, and I'll answer it. Yeah. Um, I believe they also found the medieval manuscript that they, a, that using a recipe found in that manuscript, they created a type of, uh, <coughs> um, say, syrup, not syrup, but a type of cure that when used on MRSA, it was actually able to wipe out MRSA. It was a medieval manuscript. It, 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 I, I don't know about that particular piece, but I do know, for example, that, that we do find things that way very interestingly. One of my favorite drugs for malaria, artemisinin, was discovered when people did an archaeologic dig in China, and they found this uh, earthen pot, and in it there were uh, papers that described this particular plant that had uh, artemisinin in it, and now that's considered one of the best, if not the best, uh, 
key drugs to use to treat somebody for malaria. So we do find that the ancients had good medications and that every now and then they do pop up as, uh, as something of great value. Yeah? How about smallpox? Pretty much constant? He, he, he mentions in his work a number of different skin uh, ailments in a number of different, uh, and he, you know, he talks about a pox, but sometimes he's referring to syphilis, and sometimes, right, he, he, he might actually be referring to, to uh, smallpox. So it, it's hard to tell um, in some of his work. But uh, yeah, smallpox, of course, has been a huge killer of mankind as well. Luckily, that's something that, thanks to vaccines, yay, plug for vaccines, we were able to, uh, to eliminate from the, from the human population. It, it's one of the few uh, pathogens that's limited to humans, and that allowed us to get to that level of eradicating it from the world. I worked a long time with leprosy, and originally, uh, prior to the 1960s, we thought leprosy was a purely human disease as well. Uh, then, of course, um, Shepard and the work in the mouse foot pad showed that it could at least be um, uh, artificially uh, given to, to mice. Then the armadillo was discovered to have it, and then in the 80s, we found that non-human primates have leprosy, and, and I spent some time doing research on that as well. And of course, that ended the ability to completely wipe out uh, leprosy. Okay, well, thank you for your attention.